So welcome today to our um, career ministry Zoom on April 19th. We're so excited to have Christina uh, join us today. And she is going to go ahead and introduce herself because um, she comes with such a wonderful um, background and experience and proven um, expertise. Um, so she's a serial entrepreneur and um, servant leader. And we're just really blessed to have her. So um, she's got a little story to share. And I know you're going to love hearing from her directly. So I'll just go ahead and hand it over to you, Christina. Tracy, thank you so much for this opportunity. And hello, friends. It's so good to see you guys. Um, and I'll I'll begin with, I, I firmly believe that strangers are just people, are just friends that I haven't met yet. So um, that's why I, I wanted to welcome and, and share that we're all friends here. Um, as Tracy mentioned, my name is Christina Rossini. I'm born and raised in Dallas, and uh, I've had I've kind of woven an interesting life of based on projects. Um, I I have ten years in corporate telecom B two B sales experience, which uh, five years ago I walked away from and uh, traded up and became a full time entrepreneur. And for the last five years, I've been running two different small businesses. Um, and interestingly, they were in two completely different industries. Um, the most recent one, we actually have recently, um, we've been winding it down after the last four years. Um, more on the story of how to break into new industries, which is the purpose of this presentation. But first, I wanted to share a brief story that may set the tone for us, especially those of us who are seeking and discerning what is next in life, whether it's career, a new industry, certifications, whatever. So um, I'll just tell you this. In 2018, I this was right at the very tail end of my corporate telecom career. I went to Spain and I hiked the full Camino de Santiago, uh, which was five weeks hiking across Northern Spain. And it was one of the greatest joys of my life. Um, it, if you've heard about it and you're and you even feel a small inclination to learn more about it, I do it. It's it's so worth it. It's so lear worth learning about. Anyway, it's this walking pilgrimage across Spain, and um, I won't go into the whole story of what it is, but um, I was just about to start my. I just finished my first full day of like almost thirty days walking, and I was at breakfast of the hostel that I was staying at the night before. And over breakfast, I met this guy who was like some a young, like Eastern European guy, Lithuanian or something like that. Anyway, he was there. He had been on the um on the Camino for the last three months walking. And so I, of course I was asking him all these questions. I was like, oh my gosh, like I just started yesterday and you're just about to end yours today. And like key takeaways, like, you know, what have you learned? And he said, you know. When I first started this, I was I had a lot of fears specifically around running out of money. And he said that he ran out of money in the first um in the for after the first month and he had another two more months to go. This guy was walking living off the land and on this this pilgrim path for two months penniless. He told me that um and he, it's the kind of path where you like you walk and it's a it's a trail system kind of like the Appalachian Trail or like the Pacific Crest Trail. And so you you meet a lot of people on the way, and even if you're journeying solo as he was and um and as I was, you can you're never really quite alone. I mean, you meet friends along the way. Anyway, he said that he linked up with and he he became friends with a monk who was also walking the Camino solo, and for twelve days, they were walking together and like staying in the same little albergues and guest houses and hostels together, and the monk was also traveling without money. So um, but he this guy said that. Every day, they're all, they, all their needs were always met. They always had a place to stay. They always had food to eat. And they just, they, you know, just, they were provided for, you know, one way or another. And he said that um, there was a, there was one day where they didn't have anything to eat and that turned, and they went to bed hungry. They, they woke up um, the next day and they were, they were still really hungry. They still had no money. They were, um, they had been walking and they, they came to a pause on the, on the journey that day. And they were like, well, we're not quite sure where we're going to get our food, but, you know, it'll be provided for us. We know that. And the monk was a bit more, um, was a bit more sure of, of that than this young gentleman was. But anyway, um, as they were sitting there, just kind of contemplating like what their, 
what they were going to be doing and where their meal was going to come from, some stranger on the trail walked up to them and handed them a 10 euro note and said, I just felt the need to guys. And they were, oh my gosh, look at that. <laughs> so anyway, they went and they, they went to a bakery, bought a loaf of bread, which they ate for dinner. And they, they, they spent uh, three euros, I think. They, and then the young guy said to the monk, you know, should we go ahead and buy some groceries for food tomorrow? So we've got some meat. And the monk said, no, tomorrow takes care of itself. We're sufficient today. And that's all we have to worry about today. Like our bellies are full tonight. So the kid was like, okay, right. On. Like it makes sense. So they, they found a place to stay probably like in a church as is typical out in Spain. And they woke up the next morning, they went to, um, they went to a little shop to go and get some food and provisions for that day with their seven euros they had left. Um, they go into the shop, the shopkeeper is feeds them a whole full breakfast is putting food in their backpacks. Their backpacks are so overflowing with food that they are giving it away to people outside. The shopkeeper refuses payment. This kid tells me the story after he'd been on the trail for 90 days. And it was that story stuck with me the entire time I was on the Camino and having my own journey. And then in the years since then, which was five years ago, and what's always struck me about that is that we are provided for. We may not, we may not know where and when or why it's, you know, it's going to come, but all of our needs are do eventually get met. And that can be especially scary when we're trying to find our calling or when we're we're thinking about changing jobs, or if we're, you know, if we're forced into a career transition or a job transition through whatever circumstance. But um those we just our job is to just do what's in front of us and do something in the best interest of our future selves. So I just wanted to open up with that story since that's really stuck with me for a long time. So uh, I wanted to share with y'all a little bit about my own personal experience and how I have broken into new industries where I knew nobody or close to nobody. I've done this twice pretty drastically in the past five years, not because I really like challenges, but I just, as I mentioned earlier, I feel like I've just kind of woven an interesting life that's kind of project based and projects, as we know, kind of start and end and, you know, they just kind of flow. So I just want to share from my own personal experience what's worked for me in the hopes that this might be able to, to help someone here. Okay, here we go. So I'll, I'll, as far as agenda for the next um, 45 minutes or so, um, I will, I'll share a little bit more about the background um, briefly, and then I'll also share with you the two different, um, the two different kind of ways in which I've like kind of flowed through life when I've been contemplating and like planning an exit or a big change and then also in, in the way of lifestyle interviews, and I'll go with, over a little bit about what that is. Um, that's kind of more like discernment kind of very beginning of the journey. Um, and then I'll also share with you my four steps to that I took when I was able to become an insider um, as an industry outsider previously. Once I landed on an industry and really committed, I'll tell you a little bit about how like tactically how I was able to kind of like get myself in, become a known entity and be able to bring value. Uh, and at the end, of course, I'll share my contact information. Um, I'll also let y'all know this is totally casual conversation. So um, I think we are going to have some time for Q&A at the end, but please, this is a two-way dialogue. Um, so if there are any questions, just feel free to jump in. Um, Tracy, may I ask you to kind of moderate if there's people that are like raising their little yellow hand on the on the yeah. screen, like kind of weave them sure. in. Thanks. I will do that. And if any also um, chat, I can monitor chat as well. Fab. Thank you're you. welcome to share your LinkedIn profiles on um, or like what you're what you're looking for also online. I know there was a few people who didn't have um, the ability to talk when we were intro. So I don't want you to distract from listening to Christina because that's most important. But feel free to quickly share that at some point as well. Thank you. All right. So a little bit about me. Um, born and raised in Dallas. I, uh, I graduated from Ursuline. I went to school at University of Oklahoma, got my marketing degree up there. And then um, at the right after I graduated, I spent six months doing a work exchange in Central America, came back at the very height of the 0809 financial crisis, uh, which I was blissfully unaware of being kind of off grid in Panama for a while. <laughs> and so I came back in January of 09 
and um, quickly got hired at a um, as a business to business uh, telecom outside sales rep um, for a company called C Beyond. Um, and then uh, parlayed that, changed um, changed jobs, and I ended up having a ten year uh, lucrative sales career in the telecom industry. After C Beyond, I worked for a company called Logix. Um, and I was selling to small mid-sized companies, um, selling internet and phone line connectivity and selling against the big dogs like AT&T and Verizon and Time Warner. Um, so I, uh, I was really happy doing that. And I was, I was well compensated. I loved making connections. I loved um, my relationships with my clients and relationships with my uh, referral partners that I came to know in the industry. Um, and selling was super easy and it kind of became routine. And I felt like I was built for more. I I felt like I had extra capacity. I really kind of was trying to like create a new role for myself within my company. Um, and I just, I was I just kind of was met with a lot of resistance and I really, I got the picture after several months of kind of struggling and, and kind of swimming upstream with trying to create a new role for myself that um, employers are really happy with good sales reps just to keep them as sales reps as the money makers. And they really aren't interested in advancing their career to take them away from sales. So um, after I got that picture, I was like, okay, I need to start planning my exit but I want to make sure that I do it really intentionally. Like I definitely want to make sure that I don't just hop from one sales job to the next because that's what I've always done. But I really wanted to, I wanted to dig into and like hone my strengths and really understand better how I can best live in my strengths and show up and be the best version of myself at work. And so um, I heard about this book called Designing Your Life, which is written by two Stanford professors who teach the most popular elective course at Stanford undergrad by the same name, Designing Your Life. And this book came out in 2016 and I read it at the end of 2016. Um, and uh, this book is like part book, part workbook. And this was the book that started me on the journey of planning my exit, um, which I did successfully exit my, my telecom career. Um, a year and a half later, which sounds like a long time. However, I, I did it absolutely on my terms. I did a lot of learning um, and I was absolutely confident that I was making the right move when I did. Um, and it was great timing. That would not have happened had I not taken the time and been patient to really understand what I was looking for and where my talents and gifts lied. Um, one of the things I really liked about this book was um, there's lots of exercises in there and I highly recommend it, first of all. Um, lots of exercises to kind of help me understand like um, what kind of work I'm best suited for and what kind of an out a desired outcome I would like in life. Um, work and like not just work related, but like just life related really. Um, so really enjoyed that. And I'll be talking, I got the idea for my for lifestyle interviews from that book in fact. So more on that um, here really soon. Um, so I left corporate in 2018. I mentioned I went to Spain. Um, I like to say that I that I walked away from corporate by walking 500 miles across Spain, which is exactly what I did. Um, process, had a good little bookend, a little mini sabbatical, and then I hit the ground running. And um, so I left corporate to run a coffee importing business that I fell into um, in the summer of 2017. And I was my final year of my sales career in telecom, I was um, doing both. I had a little side hustle where um, I developed a relation, long story, not for this presentation, but um, one of my college friends invited me down to um, Southern Mexico for a week. And I, I went, um, and during that week, um, I came to know a, a, a small coffee cooperative in Chiapas, Mexico, who was look very, very strong brand in Mexico, but was looking to break into the U.S. market and develop new um, new markets north of the border. And so the coffee co-op asked my friend and I if we would help them commercialize their coffee in the U.S. And we said, sure. And we went in totally blind. Um, we, again, we love the story for right now, but the point is that we just figured it out and we did it successfully for four years. Started a side hustle, we both had full-time gigs. This was our side thing. Um, for about a year, it quickly ramped up to become more than just a side thing. And as I was contemplating my exit um, from corporate, I was like, I didn't quite know what I was gonna be doing, but then it became quite clear that the coffee thing was I need to be doing full-time. And so when I exited, it was to run my coffee business full 
which I did for a year. Um, and then um, anyway, so that was the coffee and thing. thing. Um, and then, so I ran my coffee business full time um, for a year, built a, built a little flywheel to where it didn't need my constant attention and, um, and concern. I kind of built lots of systems and processes in place. So it was fairly self-sustaining. Um, and so um, at the end of, so I did that from 18 to 19. And in the summer of 2019, I had a little bit of extra time in my hands. Um, again, I really didn't need to be full-time anymore like it did since it was built. And I turned to my husband, Mark, and um, I was like, hey, what if we went into business together? And what if we relaunched this electrical contracting business that you had started several years ago that's kind of been dusty and like and like kind of inactive? what if we relaunched that and we became woman-owned certified and we could become eligible for like, I don't know, government work or other, other opportunities that we otherwise aren't eligible for. And, you know, I can relaunch or I can launch the commercial side of it and really, you know, do things differently than, you know, than how they were previously. And he said, that sounds great. Thought you never offer it. Let's roll. Like ready to go. So that was the beginning of jumping into a, running a, a small zero employee, zero revenue commercial electrical contracting business, which in under four years, we by January of this year, we ramped up to nine employees and 1.25 million in revenue. That was our closing revenue last year. In under four years, guys, other than my husband, I literally knew no one in this industry. I just, I'm good at making friends and meeting people and just figuring stuff out and bada bang. So I'm going to show you exactly what I did to, to ramp up to that. Okay. So again, I've said a few times, this is purely what's worked for me. Okay. So as I've mentioned, I consider life a series of projects. Um, everything in life is impermanent. And therefore my philosophy is it's impermanent, have fun, like take it seriously, but not too seriously. And I just consider life a series of projects. And with project-based work, like I'm just constantly honing my skills and just one kind of builds on the next. Um, as such, I kind of consider our, our God-given talents and you know things that we're born with, that's our, you know, if it's using a classroom analogy, that's the knowledge that we gain through going to school. And then our jobs and careers that we use our talents in, those are like the classrooms that we apply the knowledge in. So our, in, our innate talents are, no, don't change. I mean, like if you're a good relationship builder or if you're a really good design thinker or, um, a, you know, if, if learning comes naturally to you and you can like grasp things and crystallize them and break it down, that's a gift. Like that's a huge talent and that's not going to change. You know, it might show up and look different based on the kind of work that you're doing, but it, that's a, that's a stream that has the same water flowing through it. Does that make sense? Um, so I just kind of consider it that way. And maybe as such, I just, I haven't had any real fear when it comes to like thinking about making a change. It's like, well, giddy up, we're just going to make a change and it's going to work out. You know, we'll just have to learn something new, but like, it'll, it'll be okay. Like, I know that I'm well suited for this. Okay, so I mentioned earlier lifestyle interviews. This is something that I learned about in that book, Designing Your Life. Um, what this is, is it's basically where I would connect with people that are, I would find people, first of all, find people that are doing the kind of work that I think I might want to do. This is purely a learning endeavor, all right? A learning and strategic networking endeavor, I should say. So it's identifying and like finding and befriending people that are doing the kind of work that I'm interested in doing, whether it's new industry, new line of work, whatever. Um, in this case, I, I did lifestyle interviews when I was still working in my telecom sales career and I would lunch and during the afternoon and like when I could make my own schedule, I would go and I was interested, I was interviewing people who were in, um, who were professional coaches and consultants, because I was thinking I might want to investigate that as my next career. Um, and so, so basically I would reach out, I'd fi find people, reach out to them, tell them who I am, what I'm looking for. And this is usually totally, you, either totally cold or through referral, but I'll, I'll talk about how to do that in a minute. Um, and have a, a brief meeting with them and just ask them like, what is life like doing this kind of work? And just kind of, it would help me understand and kind of like get eyes and ears and on the scene to kind of determine and discern if this was what I wanted to do. 
Um, and that's literally what it is. And honestly, it's kind of almost like a little, almost, it could be considered like a little job interview, but it's totally no pressure. It's just a conversation. But if the person on the other side is, is maybe looking to add someone to their team or whatever, like, hello, I'm a, you know, I'm interested and they already know me. So here's how I did this. Um, number one, I would, I would research people working in, in this field of interest. Okay. And when I was doing it, I was looking into maybe getting into professional coaching and business consulting, but kind of more so leaning on the coaching side of it. I was thinking about going to coaching training school. Um, there are tons of schools out there, lots of certifications. Um, and I was just not quite sure I was ready to commit to this. So I really wanted to kind of do some work digging. So, um, I think I started with one person. I, um, I, I knew a guy through some networking I was doing, and um, his name's Randy Mayu. He runs a, um, a books, a monthly book synopsis. I'll talk more about it a little bit later, but it's here in Dallas. And so I told him, and he knows a whole bunch of people. And I was like, I'm kind of interested in meeting more professional coaches. Who do you know that does this? And he gave me like two or three names of people. And he said, they'll talk to you, like reach out to them. So I reached out to these people. I connected with them um, either over email or LinkedIn, typically email. And I would say, um, hey, I uh, so-and-so you know, suggested I reach out to you. Here's who I am. I'm looking, I'm interested in maybe getting involved in the professional coaching area, um, just kind of taking some tires and figuring out this is the right thing. Um, would you be open to a, a 30 minute conversation um, and I would love to just ask you some questions and kind of understand what your life is like in this kind of work. Um, and, and gosh, darn, like almost, I mean, everyone replies and they're like, of course, I'd love, you know, I'd love to talk about what I do for a living and I'd love to help someone else, you know? Um, so I would always, so I initiate a conversation, um, I, you know, schedule a meeting. Typically, I always prefer live. Um, there's nothing, there's no substitute for open face to face communication. So, um, of course, this was in 2016. The world's changed since, you know, Zoom is a great substitute. Um, but, you know, live is always ideal if you can. Um, and so I would have, you know, I would just go with them. I would, I would bring my little notebook. I'd have a few questions. But ultimately, it was just, hey, like, tell me about tell me about, you know, your role within this, you know, your line of work. And I would have prepared questions. Um, I'm really just the whole purpose of these little lifestyle interviews is just, I just want to understand, you know, I'm seeking to understand. Um, and at the end of every single meeting, I would ask who else should I know that would be open to having a similar conversation like we just had. Here's the key. It, the way that we ask questions really makes a difference of what kind of answer we're going to get. If I was just to say, do you know anyone else who's open to having a conversation like we just had? The only answers to that question are yes or no. And honestly, it's usually gonna be, mm, let me think about it, which is really just no. It just means that I don't have the bandwidth to like stop and, and really put some forward, you know, some time to think about this and like, you know, give you a referral and make a connection right now. But when you say, when I ask, who else should, do, should I know that would be open to having a similar conversation? The answer to that is this person is thinking, racking their minds and their mental Rolodex and their mental contacts list. And they're like, okay, who else should I introduce to Christina, who is also a, and I'm like, maybe someone else who's a professional coach or maybe a business consultant. I'll kind of like, you know, help them answer the question to like direct their thinking towards like answering the question because people by default, they want to help. Like people want to be connectors and bring value just like we do, right? They just sometimes need some help in getting there. And, you know, you have to help people help you is what I found. So by asking that question, who else should I know? That really helps to kind of prompt that. Uh, and then finally, um, the final step, oops, the final step in this is to follow up. And that is always best. But, at the very least, send a thank you email within 48 hours, ideally 24 hours after having a lifestyle interview. Um, I'm a big believer and a big fan of, um, of paper thank you notes. So whenever possible, I send a little, um, a personal handwritten letter. Here are a couple of screenshots of um, emails that I wrote six years ago when I was in the midst of this, um, of kind of the my formula for scheduling a lifestyle interview. So um, sorry if the highlighting is a little funky after I did it. I saw that it kind of like partially obliterated some of the text. So I'll just read it to you. Okay, so um, I was introduced to a guy named Mike from my friend Randy. Mike is a um, professional coach and, and consultant. So um, 
basically the I'll just uh, you know, I introduced myself, um, so-and-so suggested I connect with you. I'm just reading the highlighted, you know, the pieces. So I said, who I can, you know, who referred me to you? Um, I'm a young professional currently learning about starting an executive coaching and management consulting practice. So it's kind of like, you know, why am I here? You know, why am I, why am I talking to you and who, a little bit of who I am? Um, and I say, yeah, I'm networking, meeting a lot of coaches and consultants, blah, blah, blah. I'd like to learn from you about how you got started and how you run your business. I also could use some help in cutting through the clutter of all the multiple certifications available. So that's the meat. It's like, this is what I'm looking for. Like, I'm looking to learn what you clearly already know. Um, and then at the very end, I said, are you free for a phone call or maybe, or perhaps meet for a quick coffee in the next couple of weeks? You always want to end with a question. Okay. That's the call to action. Oops. And then um, I said, thanks again. Looking forward to connecting. And then I had a PS like it, if I ever don't know someone, I usually try to figure out a reason to have to include a PS in an email. Why? People always read the PS. All right. This goes for like letters, emails, whatever. So I said, PS, I see that you also know Jane Koenigke. Um, I'm friends with Jane Koenigke. Know her as well. I saw that from his LinkedIn connection. A shared connection was a friend of ours. So I included that. So it kind of also kind of creates in his mind, like I'm already a known entity, like we already have mutual friends, right? And of course, as you can see from the top of that email, you know, he wrote back within 24 hours, you know, hi, Christina, we'd be happy to chat next week, blah, blah, blah. So, um, so there's, there's the money email. All right. Um, another, here's another screenshot of another real email that I sent um, six years ago. So I was introduced to a lady named Sharissa, also in the professional coaching arena. Um, interestingly, one of my one of my friends, like, was following her on LinkedIn. Didn't know her personally, but um, said, "Hey, Christina, you may want to connect with this lady. Like, I don't know her, but like, she seems like the kind of person that you know you might want to know in your lifestyle. Have a lifestyle interview with her. My friend knew I was doing these lifestyle interviews, and so I just like into this." this lady on LinkedIn, like put her email address out there. So I just took it and ran with it. So I sent her this simple, easy little, like four point email. Right. So number one, um, oh, let's see here. Hold on a second. This was after I connected with her. We had a, we had a phone call lifestyle interview and, um, I really liked her. And I told her about my friend, Lisa, who had been following her on LinkedIn, but Lisa and this chick, Sharissa didn't know each other. So I was like, I'm going to bring value. Just like Sharissa just brought me value in the way of this lifestyle interview. I'm going to now connect her with my friend, Lisa. They need to know each other. I'm going to bring value that way. I'm going to make, you know, introduce two friends basically. So first of all, I show gratitude. Hey, thanks again so much for your time on the phone. Your guidance really helped me get clear on my coaching vision. All right. So number one, lead with gratitude. Always say thank you first. Okay. Like early and often say thank you. That's my philosophy. Second point, um, I talked about my friend, Lisa Rubenstein, and I kind of hyped up Lisa a little bit. I was like, I told about my friend, Lisa, she's kickstarting her coaching and mentoring brand and would definitely benefit from a chat similar to how you and I just talked. All right. Number three, um, I thank Lisa for connecting me with this lady, Sharissa. You know, I connect, I put in her um, and I'm like, you need to set up a call with her. So like call to action, right? And then finally, number four, Sharissa, when I'm always looking for adding value, I'm like Sharissa, you know, or just recommended a couple of books. Here they are. I'll let you two connect it from here. So I write emails like this all the time, all the time. I write emails like this every single week, a few times a week. I love connecting people that should know each other. I just love putting people together for mutual benefit. This is a really easy format. And for, and also this is exactly how I've become able to network within a new industry. I'm able to connect people. When, you, when you're a connector of people, you become valuable. It doesn't, and I, my philosophy is connect early and often. Like I wanna feed people as much as I can. I know I'm also a big believer in the, the law of reciprocity. I know that whatever I put out in the world, like I will reap. We reap as much as we, as we put out there. What does it go? We sow, we reap as much as we sow. I think that's how it goes. Anyway, the point is, is that I just want to bring value and help people out. Okay. And this is my little form of how I do it. Okay. Um, so four steps to becoming an insider. Here's kind of, here's, I'm a big fan of like four steps, three steps, whatever. So here's my four point plan to once you've decided on breaking into a new industry, maybe you've gotten a new job in the new industry. Um, here's how you really become a known entity. So number one, research industry associations 
and show up to the meetings, okay? I mentioned earlier that there's no substitute for open face-to-face -face communication, and this is no more true than right now when we've got all these hybrid events. I mean, hybrid is good for some things, for sure. You can, you can network globally now, super easy, but there's no substitute for showing up in person, I promise you. So you get so much more value from showing up in person when it's given when you're given the option. Okay. Um, so I when I entered the construction business, when Mark and I um relaunched R Squared Electric in 2019, I literally Googled um women in construction groups search. And I found a whole plethora of women in construction and national associations and local associations and subcontractors groups. They're out there. Google, you can find them on LinkedIn really easily. Eventbrite, which thank you, Tracy, for putting this event today on Eventbrite. Um, I know lots of people that find great quality stuff through Eventbrite. So just kind of check it out. Also, word of mouth is a great way to find um, industry associations. Like if you if you know anyone in this industry, for instance, new industry, if you know someone maybe from a new job you just um, connected in with, or um, if you're you know, referring or whatever, if you know someone in the industry, ask them, how do we ask? Not, do you know of any groups? Only answers are yes or no. It's, hey, what groups, what groups should I check out to really start networking in the industry? Or what groups do you go to? You know, do you go to any, like, which ones do you go to? Can I join you at one in the future? So there's that. Again, people want to be helpful. They just, you kind of need to help people think sometimes. Help people help you. Um, okay, so secondly, I love this. Befriend people and you'll get invited to other groups. And I need to move my little, oh, here we go. Yeah. Befriend people and, and you'll get invited to other functions. So, um, as you may know, as you may see this in your own line of work and history, you know, people in the industry kind of hang out together. You'll start to see familiar faces as you start networking and showing up, um, in, you know, industry circles. Right. Um, and the more you show up, the better, because the more people see you, the more they'll trust you. And then of course, obviously, the more, the more times you show up, you'll be able to start like making friends and, and connections and colleagues, and you can start introducing people that maybe don't know each other. So as an example, um, in the construction industry, I would show up to construction related meetups, you know, people where there was, or groups where there was subcontractors, which is, I was running a subcontracting company. Um, there were general contractors and other, you know, architects, engineers, et cetera, that serve the commercial industry. Um, well, I would start to meet people kind of across these different, um, you know, collaborative functions in the same industry. Well, general contractors always want to know architects because architects are able to give business to general contractors. And then general contractors also want to know, like, plumbers, electricians, and like painters and furniture people, because those are all components that make up what general contractors do, right? Those are all parts of the construction job. So I would start to understand and kind of figure out, okay, who do these people want to know? Like what kinds of people do they want to know? And I would start to, as I was kind of making my way in these circles, I would start to connect the dots and be like, oh, here's a general contractor. Here's an architect. Oh my gosh. Like they definitely need to know each other. So I would make, bam, I would do a little a little, um, you know, connection email as soon as I could, right? And then, uh, okay, so there's a, uh, developers want to know architects and developers uh, want to know general contractors. And so I try to connect wherever I could, right? Always bring value, ABV, always bring value. Um, okay, number three, third step in becoming an insider, strategically build relationships. Um, this is key because it's, as y'all might know, it's so easy just to get caught up in the rat race of like, networking. And I'm sure a lot of us really hate networking events. I totally get it. I, I know that I'm a little bit weird. I love meeting strangers. I know that's not the norm. I get it. But building that building relationships strategically is the key. Um, how I've done this, I intentionally network and relationship develop. I've kind of showed with you, I've shared you screenshots of emails I've sent. I've told you exactly how I make connections and how I kind of introduce people together. Um, I do this because like I I want to connect people that should know each other, you know, it just wherever you can build value that way. Um, also, this helps me become a known entity. People start to say, oh, Christina, I know her. Like, oh yeah, she she knows everyone. Like she's got a huge network. I mean, I don't think I really do, but like, I just kind of, I've been getting out a lot and I just kind of have friends all over the place. And I have, I have a, a wide swath of different friends that I know, you know, just kind of my life and I, I keep in touch. So I just kind of, you kind of, People start to think that you have a larger network than you really do through a little life hack there. Um, and also, this is worth mentioning. 
Be friendly with your competition. Competitors can become great friends as well. I learned this first thing. I've learned this um, when I spent 10 years in, in telecom sales. I had to know who my competition was, but I would also, competitors became a referral source uh, sometimes. I mean, not always, obviously, but, you know, as a sales rep, I can't sell everyone. I'm not a good fit for everyone. It behooves me and my clients to be able to refer them where I'm not a good fit, right? Um, also, and then when I was running R Squared Electric, um, I knew multiple other women in the construction industry who were running their own companies, one of which runs a commercial electrical contracting company. Bigger than us, not a direct competitor. We would occasionally bid on some of the same projects, but we were both board members of National of um, Association of Women in Construction. So we became tight. We've gone to lunch um, even since we've closed down R Squared Electric earlier this year. We've gone to lunch a couple of times and she's like, how can I help you? So just goes to show, be friendly with your competitors also. I would say that's a strategic play. Um, you know, some industries, it may work better than others, but always find a way. I always look for a win-win. And then finally, fourth step is serve the industry. Um, volunteering on a committee is a really easy way to be able to get asked to join the board. Um, also a great way to serving the industry by way of volunteering. Um, is outstanding strategic relationship building. And when you've got good relationships, people look to you as a, in a center of, of influence and they come to you asking, who do you know? You know, so whereas I spent a long time asking people like in my lifestyle interviews, who else do you know that I should be with to have a similar conversation? Um, at before, before too long, I started getting similar questions. People will come to me saying, Christina, you know, a lot of people, who do you know that is, I'm looking for ABC, right? Um, and I can I can easily connect people because I did that work. You know, I kind of laid that foundation. Um, and volunteering, um, you show that you're you're likable, you're competent, you can get stuff done, you're held accountable, you can you have a servant leadership spirit, and of course, people want to work with those kinds of people. So it very easily turns into um, a nonprofit or advisory board positions. And then also when you're serving the industry, it positions you as an industry leader, you know, so um, it all, it's all circuitous, you know, it all connects as hopefully you're kind of seeing those dots connect right there. Um, of course, I'm sure a lot of us, have this quote, 80% of life is just showing up. Thanks, Woody Allen. And if this schmuck can work through life, there's, we can be, we'll be just fine, seriously, <laughs> but you got to show up seriously. Okay. Here are my top three favorite places to show up in Dallas. Um, these are three different industries that I've been going to for years that are industry agnostic. Okay. These are all places that doesn't, they're all industries. They're very diverse. Um, and these are, I think the creme de la creme of networking in Dallas, not just networking, but like learning as well. So one of them is a group that I've been a part of for, gosh, I think seven years now. Um, my friend, um, Darren McKnight, who's on this call as well. I know him through business navigators. This is a servant leadership organization that's been around for many years. They, they're super events driven. There's, they have like 55 events a year. There's a monthly happy hour. There's a monthly speaker breakfast um, on a Friday, one of the Fridays out of the month. And they also, um, Business Navigators also has five different special interest groups. So whether you're on the corporate track or you're an entrepreneur, there's, we've got special interest groups that kind of attach to lots of different things. Um, I also call it a professional learning organization, but everyone that's in Business Navigators is all about how can I help you? And they really do walk the talk. Um, businessnavigators.org. And I've got the URLs of all these groups at the bottom of each of these little tiles. Okay. A second really good group that I highly recommend is Conscious Capitalism, the Dallas chapter. So Conscious Capitalism is a global movement all about business as a force for good. And they believe in elevating humanity through business. Um, it was actually started by a couple of guys, one of which is John Mackey, who founded... Um, uh, Whole Foods Market. So he's one of the two co-founders of Conscious Capitalism. Um, anyway, there's global. The cool thing about this group is that the local Dallas chapter is very active, um, also very event driven. They have events once every couple months or so. Um, they're very purpose driven. So the tenets of Conscious Capitalism are um, having a multi-stakeholder orientation and like conscious leadership and conscious culture. So 
it's good, healthy, high functioning um, business networking, right? Um, and it's uh, there's global chapters, so they also have like um, Zoom meetings. So if you're if you're looking to join an industry or if you're in one currently that has a global presence, um, conscious capitalism would actually be a great way to to get in and kind of meet some compadres and and build some relationships um, even outside of DFW. And then my third and final favorite place is the first Friday book synopsis. Um, this speaks to my inner geek. I love reading. Um, this guy, Randy Mayu, has been at this for 25 years. Um, he's a he's a former church minister and he just loves reading. And so every every month on the first Friday monthly, he hosts a breakfast at the Park Cities Club um, over at Tollway in North Taiwei, open to the public. A small fee he charges like $39 or something but it's well worth it the buffet breakfast is badass um and it's really good anyway so he hosts this thing where he does two 15 minute book synopses two different books that he he reads for a living and then he does a synopsis the synopses are so thorough and so engaging you feel I always feel as though I've read the book at the end of this thing um, before the pandemic there was easily a hundred people at these things I think the pandemic has thinned out a little bit but don't let that dissuade you. I still recommend showing up. It's um, it's an early morning thing, but you never know who you're going to meet at this first Friday book synopsis. It really is the who's who of Dallas. Um, and um, did I mention the breakfast is really good? It is. It's worth checking out. Um, so I mentioned earlier, I like lists. I like kind of itemizing things. All of this to say, I've given a lot of little gems of kind of how I've ordered my life. But if this all boils down to just one slide, it's this. My three rules of life are show up, be a friend, and be of service. That's it. If you show up and you're a friend and you're of service and you help others, life will work out, guaranteed. And you will like you will be able to help others and others will help you multifold. Uh, and in closing, I just wanted to share, um, I really like quotes, um, and I, this is one of my faves, I took this years ago outside of Thanksgiving Tower in downtown Dallas, but we should always remember, give thanks for any blessings already on their way. All right, thank you so much, everyone. Um, this has been a great joy. Please reach out to me. I'm happy to um, connect LinkedIn. And um, feel free to reach out afterwards, um, email, what have you, happy to help. And perhaps I'll, I'll see you around Dallas at one of my favorite places to show up. Thank you. Well, Christina, that was absolutely fabulous. And you can just tell you're leading, you're authentic, um, you're walking the talk and providing the tips of what you've done. And it um, definitely uh, can show in a lot of ways. So we just really appreciate you. Do you have time for a few, um, a few questions? I think Absolutely. we have like 10 minutes left. Before we do that, I just want to mention we um, we are going to have another wonderful speaker um, in two weeks, and that's going to be on Wednesday, May 3rd. We have partnered with the um, a national organization, Crossroads Careers, and we have the board of directors, Dave Sparkman, who's going to be on our call and talking about organizing your job search. So we're really excited about that. So um uh, definitely message me. You can email me at careerministry at allsaintsdallas.org to make sure you get my emails, but I'll put that on your calendars for May 3rd. Um, so before that, I would love to hear um, if anyone has a question for Christina, um, please feel free to, um, to ask it now. Christina is a neighbor and now friend that I have enjoyed developing because of exactly what she has shared today. But Christina, I wonder, um, I don't think we've ever talked about this. How early on did you know that you would just be building this tapestry of experiences? Because I've always, as a child, I always, always taught you either know where you're going or you're going to fail. You're a failure, right? You need to know what you're going to start in college. You need to follow these um, exact steps. Otherwise, you're considered uh, unsuccessful. But how, how long ago did you understand that that wasn't necessarily a formula that would, in your life, be meaningful or successful? 
candidly, I feel like I'm still kind of reminding myself of that now. I mean, I think, um, first of all, I was raised really similarly. It was like, you're going to go to college. You're not going to change your major because you're going to do a personality profile in high school and figure out what the heck you're going to do. <laughs> and so I, I, I feel like I just kind of picked it up. I feel like being in outside sales really kind of trained me to talk to strangers, figure stuff out, you know, kind of trained me to think in a certain way to, you know, look for solutions, look for a win-win. And I think if anything, it probably started there. And then I, in the, but I've always, in my adult life, I've always had lots of different varied interests. You know, I always had something like, even when I was in college, I had multiple little jobs. I was always like, I always wanted my own money. So I always just like made it happen. I always was like busy and working. And so I kind of, maybe it started there and I just kind of realized like, you know, I have one life, but I've got lots of multiple interests and I've got lots of talents, but probably like three top talents that I'm really good at. And so I think I've probably just figured, surely, you know, I want a cohesive quilt to like wrap it all, you know, kind of wrap it all in and like sew it all up. So um, I just was like, you know, there's got to be a way to, you know, write my LinkedIn profile or build a resume to kind of wrap it all in together. And enough time to do that. I was like, you know what? Like I'm, I'm one person and I, you know, everyone has lots of varied interests. I'm like every, no one person's just one track, you know, like there's more to life than just working and staying, doing the same thing. And so I just started thinking about life like that. And I was like, you know, and then I, I guess it was a handful of years ago that I was like, you know, I kind of just, life's a series of projects. I mean, this is coffee was one project and you know, R squared electric is one project and college was a four-year project. And, you know, like you think about chunking up your life into kind of what you've done. And, um, that's just kind of how I started thinking of it. And I was like, you know what, I think that's kind of right. I'm just going to roll with this. And it also, I feel like that took, that gave myself permission to like remove pressure. It's like, sheesh, just because I'm a good sales rep doesn't mean I have to keep doing that. Or just because you're a great accountant doesn't mean you're stuck. Just because you went to law school doesn't mean you're stuck. You have to be a lawyer. Shoot. You know, there's other ways that you can apply those talents and gifts and strengths in other ways, you know, like pretty much anything can be applied outside of just this really narrow focus, you know, and shoot. I mean, we got one life. Might as well just explore and have fun and just try different things and see what works. Well, Christina, this is Darren. Thanks so much for your presentation. You you have really shared a lot of golden nuggets here. I hope everybody takes those to heart uh, because they're, they're, they're the nuggets I've lived by my entire career in life too. And I, I think of, uh, you know, being yourself and being of service and being a friend uh, and showing up are absolutely key. Uh, you know, one thing that I was going to ask you is, you know, when, when you run into a situation where maybe you're you're struggling a bit, how do you kind of overcome that? Because that's what job seekers do. They're going through a struggle. They're going through all the emotions. Um, they're, they're getting down on themselves at times. How did you kind of pick yourself up and just go? So um, as a lifelong practicing Catholic, I pray a lot. And, um, recently, um, starting in January, when we, when I discerned that the course of action was to close down our company, that was probably, I'll use that as an example of a very recent, very, very real kind of high stakes example. Um, and I, I said a prayer to God. I said, Lord, I, I surrender. Um, I work for you. You're the owner and CEO of this company. Uh, show me what I need to do to be a good employee for you. Amen. And I literally... <laughs> said that prayer on a Sunday <laughs> and a series of events unfolded that week, starting with Monday. And we laid everyone off that Thursday. So be careful what you pray for, because you might just get it quickly. And, <laughs> but again, like I, you know, so I, I pray a lot, but I also like, I've been working on just yielding, like, you know, some may call it surrender. It just, you know, just saying, you know what, like, I can only control so much. I can really only control what I think, say, and do. Can't control other people. Can't control outcomes. I can do something in my best interest of my future self, which I'm a big proponent of, is, you know, I don't just like say, oh, well, okay, sarah, sarah, I'm just going to bumble along. I mean, I do what I can. You know, I, I feel I take responsibility for setting myself up for success, but I can't control what happens. I just can control what I do or don't do. So I feel like, 
having that kind of larger perspective. Um, and honestly, dirty little secret is surrendering helps me not to worry. Like I really largely don't worry anymore. And I used to be so, when I was a kid, I was so full of worry and anxiety, but I just kind of feel like I've like zoomed out. And I'm like, you know what? I, I can't control a dang thing. <laughs> I can just do one thing here. Uh, great advice. That is a true testament to your faith. And I think that's what it all comes back to. And, you know, obviously in difficult times, it can be a time where we question things, where we, you know, it's okay to struggle. God wants to hear your struggles too. He wants you to be in regular communication with him. And he is the only one on this earth, you know, on in the world that knows exactly what's going to happen because we don't, we don't have control over anything. And so um, those are really great tips for, for how to do that. Thank you so much. So any um, last words before we close? Okay, well, feel free. Um, there's some chat in, some people have um, shared their link, LinkedIn. Um, definitely would love for y'all to connect with each other. Um, and then just thank you, thank you, Christina, and everyone who's on. Um, I hope this has been an inspirational presentation. You can just feel her energy and we can just hopefully bottle up some of that and take it along with us. And um, the world will be a great place to uh, to go ahead and put that servant leadership, being a friend um, and uh, serving others showing up. So um, dear Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for all of those um, who could be on and just uh, bless their efforts. Uh, bless them surrendering, allow them to be able to surrender. We know that's not easy, Lord. Um, so just give them your um, your signs um, and show them the path and help us trust in your timing um, because we know your timing is perfect. It's not always our timing, but we just ask that, um, that you allow us to trust you better each day um, and show up. Um, in Christ's name we pray. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Okay, thank you so much. We're um, just happy to have you all and uh, feel free to reach out or connect if there's anything else we can do for you um, at Career Ministry. So have a wonderful Thanks, day. Thanks, Tracy. Take care. Thank you so Bye. much. Thank you. Bye.